I've got 11 o'clock here, so I'm going to get started. Um, I think we're running into uh, lunch, and so I'm not really afraid of going uh, too far over. So, uh, but at 11.50, you won't hurt my feelings if you need to get up and walk out. So, okay, my name is Brett Estrade. I work for cPanel, and I'm going to be talking about OpenMP and uh, this OpenMP, Perl OpenMP project that um, I kind of started on GitHub. Okay, so what is a Perl OpenMP project? It's just a bunch of people that um, I guess have been uh, collaborating a little bit, mainly through IRC, perl.irc.perl.org. It's members of uh, Pound Native and uh, Pound PDL. And I've gotten we've gotten contributions from, from multiple uh, interested parties. So the main um, the main goal is to leverage OpenMP support that is present in GCC, the compiler with, which uh, builds probably 99.9% .9 of the Perl interpreters out there. And I'm going to obviously talk about what OpenMP is, but it's been available on GCC since version 4.2, which goes all the way back to 2005. And uh, the main goal of the, that capability is to leverage multiple CPUs in a shared memory environment. And we've got two current releases on CPAN. The first one is Alien OpenMP. And basically, it makes uh, writing uh, C code using inline C very easy because in order to invoke OpenMP, you do need to uh, have a couple of flags and a, an include header file in your C code. And then the other one is OpenMP environment. And this is actually the first module that was created for OpenMP uh, for this project. And it all it really does is allows you to programmatically update the environmental variables that OpenMP runtime works for. Okay, so the goals of this talk, we're going to, I'm going to talk about OpenMP almost entirely. So you're going to, I don't think we have any Perl in this talk, but it, it's necessary knowledge, I think, for you to get the most out of the talk tomorrow. So I'm a, we're going to learn a little bit about OpenMP, specifically as it applies to C code. OpenMP is supported for C++ and Fortran, but all the examples that we have are going to be C code, very simple C code. I'm not a C programmer, so. Um, don't don't get too worried, and then we're going to learn how to control the runtime and what learn what the runtime is. So learning OpenMP, the basics. If if we were going to have a formal class, and I was going to give you a proper presentation, it would take about four hours, I would estimate, to properly cover everything. And I know this because I used to work many moons ago. I worked for a university, and one of the things that we did was training for these kind of technologies. MPI is another one, message passing interface. OpenMP is for leveraging large shared memory machines, basically. We have 50 minutes, well, less now. Mastering OpenMP can take a semester, and I'm using you know university terms because a lot of the OpenMP code that is written is done so by domain scientists working in research, university research environments. But there's a lot of YouTube videos, there's a lot of tutorials, and then, um, and uh, I'll, I'll link to a, uh, a talk. It was more of a training that I did over 10 years ago now. I used to work for University of Houston. Uh, and one of the train, and we did OpenMP specific uh, research, language research. And so what I did a talk, and it's, it's got pretty, pretty in depth coverage of the things that we're going to be talking about. All right, learning Perl basics can be covered in a semester. We have zero minutes to talk about it today. So hopefully, you know a little bit about Perl. And as we all know, mastering Perl can take a lifetime. So let's begin. Okay, I talked about this. Uh, the project came out of PDL, Pound PDL and Pound Native. Pound PDL, that's the Perl data language uh, IRC channel. If, if you're interested in the topic of parallel programming, scientific computing, uh, any you know performance related uh, programming using Perl, I would absolutely check out Perl data language. It's amazing. There's some really, really, really uh, neat things uh, that come with PDL and that can be uh, included within PDL. Uh, I don't mention here, but I would also uh, encourage you to check out the Alien Project. 
it's a very, very neat, uh, just I guess family of modules for interfacing with uh, with uh, you know, compiled code, shared objects, that sort of thing, uh, external libraries, like alien libraries. And then the goal is, uh, I was kind of being cheeky here, but uh, ID8 improved the Prove the synergisms between OpenMP, Perl, Perl the language, and then Perl the interpreter. Okay, which we know is a sequential process. Okay, so SMP is symmetric multiprocessor, I means symmetric multiprocessing, and it's everywhere now. Um, <clears throat> and this is this doesn't really capture, um, I guess, modern PCs anymore. There are more cores on your laptops and your desktops now. Probably even in your cell phones, but what this represents is the uh, is a is a computing environment where there's four CPUs. Each CPU has its own cache, so we'll call that L1. Uh, and then, say each uh, each pair of CPUs is connected over a fast memory, and I think we refer to that usually as a socket. And then there's an L2 cache that connects those two CPUs, and then the banks of sockets are then compared. Are connected using the main memory. Okay, and each time you go, uh, you go from L1 to L2 to main memory, you're experiencing uh, slower and slower memory access. Okay, you're also dealing with cache coherency issues, but we're not going to be talking about that. Um, but the, the point is, you've got CPUs, some number of CPUs on your computer, and they can all uh, see the same memory, and we can take advantage of that using OpenMP. Perl. Now, when we talk about multiprocessing in Perl, typically what we're talking about is using fork. Okay, we're not talking about using the system fork here because what a system fork does is it takes a process, it literally makes a clone of this process, and then it continues running. It doesn't know it's a clone, okay, like some of you here don't know you're a clone. Um, but in any case, there's no communication between the, the processes. You have to do something like um, IPC interprocess communication. You can use main types, you can use actual files, you can use um, Redis is, a, is, is, is good for this kind of thing. Uh, but in any case, uh, and there's, there, are some, there are some interesting ways of uh, sharing memory among Perl processes that have been forked within Perl. Um, but they're very tedious and, and although interesting, I and I want to look at them, I just have them. OpenMP just gives you a pretty easy way, although albeit external way to share memory. But this this is what we have now in Perl. We have these um, heavyweight processes, we'll call them, and they each have their own memory and they can't communicate directly. The operating system enforces these boundaries um, among these different processes. So when we're talking about shared memory, we're talking about light threads, okay? You've got a single parent process. And then when, when we talk about fork in SMP, we're talking about creating a team of threads and they're lightweight threads. So they still, they, they are not processes as the operating system considers processes. They have the same main memory view, okay? So they can see the same memory addresses uh, among all of the threads. And then, um, you know, there can be private protected memory within each thread and OpenMP provides for that. Uh, but this is the view we're looking at. We have a single process and then it, it spawns some threads. It's all to the operating system. It's still considered one process. Logically speaking though, it is, uh, it's multiple threads and each thread can be placed on a core. And this is where we get our, our parallelism from. Okay, OpenMP is, it was originally designed to be an easy way to take a single threaded program and then make it threaded for, um, for multi-core environments. And it came out of high performance computing. It was uh, intended for domain scientists who were writing say Fortran code primarily to take some sequential code that they had written. They've impl implemented their algorithms doing ma matrix operations and their, their weather simulations or ocean model simulations or nuclear explosion simulations and uh, speeding them up for what was then some uh, pretty exclusive access to shared memory multi-core environments. But now 
it's ubiquitous and uh, it's, it's, uh, this is how we can take advantage of it. So they would take, they would have old uh, Fortran codes or C codes that were, you know, basically nested loops. They run in a single process and then OpenSD came along and said, here's a good way that you can actually take advantage of these multiple um, processing environments without having to rewrite your code or rewrite your algorithm. So this is this is the basis of OpenMP. It's available on all, on pretty much all modern computers. Uh, like I said, GCC since 2005. Uh, Intel's compiler suite supports it. PGI, Portland Group, Magus, Numerical Algorithms Group, Jitsu. If you go and actually look and see how many companies make compile C compilers, I think you might be amazed. I'm not sure anymore, uh, but there's a lot, and they they all tend to participate. In the standards board, which governs OpenMP, it's called the Architectural Review Board. Um, one thing I did want to point out: I tried to look for uh, open source projects that take advantage of OpenMP, and the only one that I could find was Image Magic, and, and you can kind of that kind of makes sense because it deals with uh, manipulating the images, which are basically just large data. So it's a really good application there. Um, but and I already knew about uh, Image Magic. In any case, uh, I think it's a it's a good opportunity for a lot of projects to do it if you don't want to sit there and write low level say key threads. So what does OpenMP consist of? I guess you can imagine you have existing code, although you can you can program from scratch with OpenMP in mind. But assume you have some single just the C program that has some loops in it, or it's doing some things that are that are some independent like tasks and um, you wanted to parallelize it because now when you're you're on this uh, big beefy box and it's got uh, I don't know 20 CPUs on it and like uh, I don't know almost a terabyte of memory. It's like why are you just running these you know single threaded programs when you could take advantage of these these huge machines? So it's it's a OpenMP. You, you would take a code that you already have, let's say, and you would put in these declarations behind code comments. And they're basically hints for the compiler where you tell it and say, okay, this is where uh, you, can, you can basically spawn some threads and then do some work independently. And that's essentially what OpenMP is. Now, if your compiler does not support OpenMP, then since it's behind a code comment, it's going to be ignored. So that was another, another advantage of the way that they took the, 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 uh, the approach that they have taken with OpenMP is. The code can you can take code that is uh, you know maybe it runs on several environments. One of them may not support OpenMP, but others may, and so you don't have to you know mess with the, the if delf depths and all this other stuff within your, your, your code. Uh, it provides a data environment, so you can actually control what variables and, and memory addresses are shared among threads and what are private and how. These are initialized within each thread, and it provides a co compiler implemented runtime. That means that uh, the compiler, it's the compiler at well as it's as it's run when you compile an OpenMP program and you run it, it the compiler in addition to transform you know in, inserting the uh, the threading uh, infrastructure. It will uh, provide you with some runtime functions where you can control like the number of threads or you can query like how many threads are currently in this parallel section, that kind of thing. And then uh, it's aware of environmental variables. I'm going I'm to get into the, how to can actually how you can actually control the runtime uh, coming up here. So uh, this is a code example. Hope may, you may or may not be able to see it, but this is about as easy as it gets. And hopefully it, uh, it, it gives a good example of what OpenMP will do. On the left-hand side, it's just a Hello World C program. Um, and you run it, you compile it, it says hi. And in the, the lower left box, you compile it normally as normal. It's GCC hi.c-o.i.x. You run the executable, it says hi, and it exits. Okay, pretty simple. On the right hand side in the blue, I have annotated the, the hello or the hi.c with basic OpenMP declarations. Now, one thing you'll notice is in line number two, 
And the, the top right blue box is I have an include, and it's include omp.h. That is provided by the compiler uh, and implements the, the runtime uh, the runtime functions that are needed, and also uh, like internal functions that it needs when it's when it's parallelizing the code and um, uh, ways to uh, your your runtime like your getters and setters for the different things like number of threads uh, that you may be wanting to run. And so the way you compile it in GCC, you see lower right. It's just these GCC dash F open MP and then the rest of the same. You have the high dot C dash O and high dot X. Now you run it and it says hi a bunch of times. The, what you have there is each thread that has been spawned is running the code. Okay. And now what's happening here is that when the, uh, when the execution of the program hits this section where it says pragma OMP parallel, it's gonna. That's where it spawns the number of threads. Now, you're asking how how is it that we got is it eight threads, seven or eight threads? I think. Uh, how how is it that we got that number of you know printouts of high? Well, that's what we're going to talk about uh, soon. But that's basically controlling the number of threads that get created when you hit the parallel section. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm adding a uh, a runtime call. And in this case, uh, so on the left-hand side, everything's the same. On the right-hand side, I'm adding a runtime call that queries the thread ID. So when a when OpenMP runs and the threads are spawned, a thread gets an ID, zero index, so zero through whatever, and I see in this case, so it is eight threads. And so you can see, I wanna show two things here. Number one, within the parallel environment, you can query things. One of them is, what thread am I? And then the other thing is that these are not run sequentially. So the ordering is indeterminate. So there's no ordering associated unless you provide some ordering constructs, some synchronization constructs. There's no ordering in force. Okay, so you see the numbers are out of order. Okay, let's see what's next. Now, if we wanted to control the number of threads, we have a couple, two ways to do it. One of them is by setting an environmental variable before you execute the code. So you can compile the code. You don't have to specify the number of threads. Uh, and then you can specify the number of threads after. Now, in the previous example, we ran it without specifying the number of threads. It will take the default whatever it whatever uh, GCC or runtime or system report says, the number of CPUs or the number of cores, okay? And that will be like the initial number of threads. Sometimes you don't want that or sometimes you wanna be very specific about the number of threads. So one thing you can do is set an environmental variable before you execute it. And here in the blue boxes, I, so in the gray box, I have the instrumented or the, the open, in, open MP code in the parallel section, it queries the thread number. And then each box, I just have it, I'm running it and defining a different number of threads. And you can see how that would affect um, execution. So bottom left, I'm running four threads, bottom right, I'm running two threads, and the upper right, I am running eight threads explicitly. So OpenMP is really easy. It's like one, one flag added to GCC, and then a couple of they call them pragmas hidden behind some comments. Okay. Okay, so just recapping here, the initial way to parallelize something within OpenMP or using OpenMP is to create this uh, insert a pragma behind a comment and just say this is parallel. So it's pragma, pound pragma, OMP parallel. We use an OpenMP provided one time, which is querying the red ID. And then we, I showed that uh, the runtime, when you run it, it's aware of what uh, the value of certain special environmental variable is. Okay. Um, so this just talks about what a declaration is. So for C and C++, it's, it's pound fragma and then OMP and then stuff. Uh, I think pound fragma is part of the C, uh, it's the C, specification and I think there are maybe other ways other things that you can add in there 
but uh, this is this is why you have pound fragma O and P instead of just like pound O and P. Now for Fortran, it's it's the exclamation point and then dollar O and P and then stuff. Okay, so that's special, uh, and this is a Fortran comment that that special stuff, the, the combination of the exclamation point dollar sign and O and P is uh, is how within the Fortran compiler. The compiler itself recognizes it or differentiates it as a uh, as an open and key declaration versus just a, some random comment it can perform. All right, what's the runtime? The runtime manages the thread execution. So when you are executing a uh, an open MP program, you get a the compiler inserts a bunch of stuff in there that does things like uh, before it spawns a number of threads it has to know how many threads is it going to spawn it has to know its data environment it, it should know you know uh, what variables are getting shared what variables are getting are private to each thread and how are they going to be initialized uh, so there's lots of stuff that the compiler has to provide at one time not just as a capability during compile time and as i do have a, a ton of bonus slides and uh, i think Y'all may be interested in seeing how uh, what actually happens when a compiler is compiling open and, uh, open and key code. So we'll, we'll get to that later, but I wanted to talk about the high points here. So in any case, provide, the runtime provides synchronization. Uh, there's ways to re, like provide reduction operations over variables. So if, if threads are, they've got private variables and they're doing some computations on them and then the, one of the you know one of the parts of the algorithm is for all of these parts from each thread to get combined in some way. That's called a reduction, and so OpenMP through the runtime provides some efficient ways to do reduction, so you're not having to kind of you know jump through hoops in order to do that and maintain the thread uh, thread safety. All right, so. SMP shared memory programming or symmetric multiprocessor programming also. But um, by default, when a parallel section is reached and threads are spawned, the memory, the memory environment that is present before the spawning of threads, I'll call it a port. So just don't get it confused with the POS6 port. Uh, it shares, it makes available all the memory and it just that was present in the in the parent process. And it just does this by virtue of doing nothing. It's it's in the the process. It's there's still one process logically to the operating system. And so when the threads are spawned, it's still within that same memory space. Okay, we've just got some uh, the threads are just a lines of execution basically that uh, that can see exactly what the parent process saw. So that is done implicitly. Although you can explicitly share memory, and I'll have. Some examples uh, probably later on, definitely tomorrow. Private variables within each thread need to be declared, and a lot of times you need to do that to ensure thread safety. So you you know um, if you've got multiple threads trying to write to the same variable or same me memory space, you're going to have race conditions, and that's always bad. Well, maybe not always, but it's not probably not what you want. And then uh, you can also control the initialization of private variables. So when you control data sharing, like I said, shared, you can specify specific variables. So imagine these are these are declarations in C code. You've got for the Pragma OMP parallel shared, you've got variables A, B, and C. Um, you're just that's more for readability. It uh, that happens inherently. If you if you're going to be sharing A, B, and C, you really don't even have to do anything. Uh, but it is good to have that in there just for readability and understanding what you know, being able to make sense about what's going on um, with the threads. Now the next one is the the private. So what we have here is if the implementation, whoever's writing it, wants each thread to have, um, you know, here it's D, E, and F variables of their own that they can write to, then this is how you would, you would specify now the, the caveat here is D, E, and F were declared outside of the parallel scope. 
So you've got declarations for, for D, E, and F outside the parallel. So before you hit that ONT parallel structure, and then when the OpenMP, when the compiler, let's say, hits this declaration, it will, um, it will basically just create variables within each thread that are identical to the size and height of the, the previous variable. However, it doesn't, it doesn't guarantee initialization. It just gives you some space in memory. So the value, the, some, and this is left according to the spec, it's up to the compiler to do. So you can't guarantee what the values of these things are going to be unless you use what is called first private. And what first private does, it explicitly says for each thread, we're going to use, we're going to basically, we're going to copy H, I, and J, which again has been declared outside the parallel scope. And uh, we're going to initialize it with the actual values that are present uh, as they've, they've been declared. Now, thread private is something um, I'll, I'll talk about tomorrow. But it's a third way to do it. It's just, it's some weird, it's a private variable that allows for functions with global scope to use the threads. Anyway, code examples help. We're not talking about this today. This is the run, an example or a subset of the runtime API. It's basically a bunch of setters and getters. Um, so say number, you can, you can set number of threads, you can get number of threads, you can get dynamic, you can set dynamic. Now dynamic refers to loop scheduling. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this and hopefully we'll get to some bonus slides. Um, locking routines, there are locks if you need to use them. And this is, uh, and uh, I don't, I don't have any experience using locks within uh, OpenMP, but they're there. There's also timing routines. So a lot of these codes, typically when somebody's writing them, they want to do benchmarking and profiling. And this is a good way to get some pretty accurate profiling and timing information with, within uh, your OpenMP, the parallel section. These are the, some of the environmental variables. Uh, open in OMP num thread we looked at. We saw what it does. It sets the number of threads if it's not explicitly set within the program itself. OMP schedule, I, that refers to how the loops, uh, how the compiler uh, or the runtime rather breaks up the work that's available for each loop iteration. Um, dynamic is, is another uh, that, that affects the loop scheduling. OMP nested, I'm not sure what that does, to be honest. OMP stack size, if you want to get, if you want to fine tune memory that's available, I believe to each thread, you can get pretty specific with stack size. I've never used it, um, but I have not, I, I'm, I'm one of, you know, I haven't done a lot of OpenMP actual like programming uh, outside of learning it and playing around with it. So, but I imagine that uh, that's things like stack size, uh, pretty useful for optimizing programs for a specific environment. OMP nested, uh, that I believe that turns on, you can nest parallel sections, so you can have threads that spawn more threads. And I think that this uh, will allow you to turn that behavior on or off. Thread limit, you can, you can set a max number of threads that are spawned. And then uh, max active levels, I think this has to do with uh, basically just coordinating work that is actually able to happen um, basically providing a limit on the amount of load that you're putting on the CPU if you're running in parallel. So, but I haven't, those are more advanced. I haven't used those. The one I use most is o open OMP num threads. So. Now the execution model, I probably should have started with this, but it's considered fork and join, but I didn't want to confuse y'all with Perl fork or POSIX fork. But the whole idea is that you have a sequential process and then you fork it into a team of threads is what they call it. And then it does its work and then you conclude your parallel section and then it goes back to being just a sequential process. And that's, that's how you probably should think about it. <clears throat> and it's nice because for us because that's what Perl is. Perl is a sequential process. Uh, I don't care how many, how many how people talk about async, all this other stuff. You're not getting outside of the fact that, that Perl is a single process, even if your code maybe logically indicates that you're doing something uh, that is pretending it's not. But, but in any case, 
it's this is useful for a portal environment because we are so tied to single process lines of execution. Um, and then there's a OpenMP also has a, a memory model which is called relaxed consistency. And this base the memory model is how how you can how you can uh, think about guaranteeing um, when when like say shared memory is updated. So a thread may update safely update uh, a variable that's shared among the threads. Well, you want to have some guarantees that another thread reading it is going to get the latest value, even if it's on a CPU that's you know way on the other side of the motherboard. Uh, and uh, so in any case, it's it's a way to think about the uh, what what guarantee, memory guarantees you have, uh, safety guarantees you have when executing the program. This is just a picture of the fork and join model. Uh, you've got one CPU, and uh, it, the app is the fork. It just spawns a number, some number of threads. Now the op it's the operating system's job to place the threads on CPUs. Uh, you can control. It's called affinity, where the threads are are being executed and uh, how, uh, you know, if there is some thread migration among CPUs, how closely, you know, can you stay to one CPU or do you pin the thread to a specific CPU so you're not, you know, wait, wasting um, you know, cash allocation, you're not having cash misses. Uh, but that's all advanced stuff um, and, and really not part of OpenMP. But in any case, this is the fork and join model. Parent process zero forks. You've got four threads. The parent process logically is is one of the, the members of the threads, the team of threads. It does its stuff and then it comes back together in a join, and then the parent process continues on, however you coded it. Memory model. Um, I'm not going to try and explain this, but basically it allows you. It gives you some guarantees that um, <clears throat> at the end of certain uh, certain scopes, uh, block scopes, let's say for us, uh, the memory will get flushed so that any shared memory will, all threads will have a consistent view of the shared memory. So uh, there's no basically stale, stale, because we're dealing with multiple levels of cache, there's no stale memory out there where one thread might see, you know, one value or, you know, in another thread that just updated it sees the most recent value. So there's some the guarantees here, uh, if you need to use, if you need to ensure that your memory is consistent across all the threads, OpenMP provides a flush pragma, um, which basically just flushes the cache, make sure that all, all CPUs have the latest updated uh, value for, you know, a variable, let's say. Okay, so we're doing good on time. We've got 17 minutes. So I'm just going to talk about some pragmas. Some more pragmas, uh, some runtime functions, and some environmental variables. So, the pragmas is where you implement what are called work sharing constructs. So, if you have a loop and you want to distribute the iterations of this loop across different CPUs, then you would use a, a work sharing construct. If you have a team of threads running and you wanted them to, at some point within the parallel section, run sequentially or um, wait or not wait on one another, then you would use synchronization constructs. And then the, we already talked about the initialization and sharing of variables. Um, can somebody, somebody mind closing that door? I think the uh, airline stewardesses are getting a little excited. Okay. The, um, <clears throat> these are some work sharing pragmas. Well, basically different pragma kinds. Work sharing, we've got parallel, which basically just creates a team of threads. We've got parallel four. So this is for C code. Uh, this tells the, this says, uh, this basically sits on top of a for loop and hints to the compiler that you're about to encounter a for loop. And so, you know, um, you're ready to do you know what you do as far as parallelizing the, uh, the, the loop, and then there's something called a section, which is pretty cool, uh, and then there's mutual exclus mutual exclusion pragmas. One is critical. This is a critical section. Okay, so within a parallel code, only uh, only one thread can operate within this section at a time. 
Uh, and then there's something called name critical sections where you can create a pipeline effect, which is pretty cool. Then you can also single out threads. So on one hand, you can do an if statement that says if thread ID or if get thread num OMP get thread num is equal to some thread number, enter into this if block. You could do that because only one, you know, the, the IDs are unique, but there are fragments that say master. If it's master, master is just ID zero. Okay. And then there's single. It says which it says whichever thread reaches this section first, execute what's inside of it. And then after that, no other no other threads are going to be getting in there. So it's it's basically um, you know race to that section. And then there's the barrier. A barrier, you just put it in within if you want all the threads to stop at a certain point proceed only when all threads have reached that point, then, then that's when you would do the barrier. Okay, some nuances. Um, so tomorrow I'm gonna be talking about, it's gonna be Perl and more examples of OpenMP, um, but some, some nuances basically are that the OpenMP environment module that I created um, allows you to update the environment like OMP not threads. Now, the nuance here is that when you compile an OpenMP program and you run it at the command line, it only has to read the environment once. So it only has to say, you know, uh, it looks for OMP num threads, let's say, and that's the number of threads it's going to use. In examples tomorrow, because I'm using inline C, uh, it actually is creating a shared object. And so it loads the binary once, but you may be running it multiple times. Okay, so I discovered that this is correct behavior and expected when you're running an executable that's been created with OpenMP. But if you've got a shared object that you're calling from Perl, that's not, that's not exactly what, what you want. Or at least I should say, I wanted some more flexibility. I wanted to be able to update an environment variable call a function again and have it, you know, know, okay, that variable has been updated, so we're gonna use a different number of threads. So that's the nuance that we're talking about, and I'll talk about it more tomorrow. Okay, considerations for, for people who program with Perl, Perlers, um, you can create library interfaces using this, and basically anything that uh, is currently an option for integrating C code or Fortran code or C++ code, um, you can uh, you can compile your, your you know, executable or your shared object that you then interface um, with uh, in your Perl program using whatever. It's like as long as you get this shared object or this binary that has been created by the compiler that has been parallelized, then it'll it'll do the right thing. Okay. And then uh, tomorrow we'll talk about the Perlish ways to manipulate the environment. And then also tomorrow, some more opportunities for use in you know, Perl and lowercase Perl itself. Lowercase Perl is an interpreter for anybody. Okay, <clears throat> I can stop and ask uh, answer questions, or I can go um, I, and I can also go on to some bonus slides. I think we have about ten minutes, and also I I don't mind staying. I think, like I said, we're running in, we're going to be running into lunch. If somebody wants to know some more details, I'm happy to go into that. So, questions? Okay, no questions. All right, we'll jump into bonus material, and I guess we'll just we'll just end when we end uh, in about ten minutes. So, the first thing I wanted to talk about is, okay, what is a compiler? What do most compilers do with these declarations inside of the code? Okay, now this is not what GCC does. Um, I haven't really looked into what GCC does. It's called uh, the library that GCC uses to implement this is called libdom. I'm not sure how the compiler itself works, um, well, works in general, but but also how it, it would take the instrumented code and, and parallelize it. So the next couple of slides are kind of small. If you want to pull it up, you can. But this, this is a compiler called OpenUH. It was one that came out of uh, University of Houston. Originally, I think it was called Open64 by AMD. They had released it at some point, but the, there's a, a group there that I worked with before I was at cPanel many years ago that called HBC Tools. And they worked pretty closely with OpenMP 
community to basically test out features. You know, the, the specification process is uh, a bunch of industry, you know, compiler writers get together and they talk about features or what kind of things they can do uh, towards OpenMP. And then they say, okay, well, we're going to experiment with these features. It was kind of a similar process to Pro Base 3. Um, but, and then, and then it's incumbent upon, say, some of the research partners like the University of Houston to go and implement it into their research compiler and see, okay, does this thing actually work? Are there any, is there anything we're going to, so this, this is, uh, OpenUH was their basis for basically experimenting with OpenMP features. So what, what rep is represented here is, this is just the steps, the stages of the compiler, the OpenUH compiler. But it, 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 you, you can see at the very end, uh, or the second to last box there, what it does is it goes through and it generates this intermediate format. Uh, it is able to include these OpenMP declarations that are hidden behind comments into the, I guess, the abstract syntax tree or, or whatever, whatever world represents. Uh, but in any case, it's a data structure that represents the code that, that is able to then be traversed and then the compiler can then go and actually in, literally insert p thread calls, okay? And there's a programmatic approach that they, they use uh, here. LLVM is probably also a good compiler, compiler to research if you're interested in how this actually happened, uh, because I believe Plain does have support. And LLVM was an early, uh, an early platform for testing things like this. Okay, this is this slide is small, but basically what it shows is if you have just like a hello world, which is, I mean, this, these are slides from a, a talk I did a long time ago, but. That's a, on the left-hand side, it's a very simple C program, like Hello World. And on the right-hand side, it's what it looks like once the compiler has basically transformed it from C code with declarations hidden behind comments to instrumented basically with all these internal uh, functions that it then put, uses uh, to do actual low-level compilation and uh, using the pthread library. Um, okay, so this is a, what is this? Well, this is an internal function. It's, oh, this is the, that main function that you saw on the left-hand side. So it goes, it goes from left to right. So the first yellow box is what you wrote. In the middle, the bigger box is an intermediate step where the compiler inserts some stuff, some function calls based on what you wrote. And then this is actually what gets compiled uh, within, at least within this uh, compiler. And uh, I've got a comment there. It says, nobody wants to write code like this. Okay, and, uh, and basically it's worse than writing actual P thread because that's really only something a computer can read. Um, but in any case, that's what it looks like under, under the hood. So you're going from hello world to this. And it's kind of, I don't know if anybody's ever done what a Perl script looks like using, I think it's BC, the BC module. But you can take, you can, uh, you can feed it a Perl script and dump it out as C. And you can look at it and it's really interesting. So like just saying print hello world, it turns into this ginormous uh, C program. And this, this isn't actually what Perl is running, but it can translate it using some, some automation and some some algorithms inside walking the, the syntax tree, it'll dump an equivalent C program and just see all the internal calls that Perl's having to make in order to create this equi equivalent C program. So nobody's gonna be writing that, but I, I do encourage you because it's interesting. It's kind of the same process where it, it takes what you wrote and it explodes it into something uh, pretty nasty looking, but it's necessary. Uh, and it's necessarily complex even for simple things because it has to be able to support complex things. So, okay. Um, okay, loops. I want to. I do want to talk about this. I've got five minutes. So what we have here is a just a for loop, and um, yeah. So in the green, the line, the, the line here. I don't know how many lines down it is, but it's pragma OMP parallel shared ABC. I'm just best being very explicit about what's getting shared. Um, a, B, and C are defined at the top of the main function as uh, floating point integers. And uh, 
each thread I'm saying within this open three parallel section that I is going to be private. Now I'm declaring I right underneath A, B, and C as an integer. And I'm not initializing it, but I am creating the variable within memory. And so when the when open and P is compiled, uh, it'll create a private variable I based on the size and type of I, which is a loop. And then within that section, I've just got a basic for loop and it's I had the pragma OMP4. And what this tells the compiler is that this loop can be distributed amongst however many number of threads you're going to be running. So basically loop unrolling, but based on the number of threads. So if you're if you're going through um, so n is 100 here, okay? Say we're running over uh, four threads, then each loop essentially is gonna get 25 iterations. Now how the iterations get distributed to each thread, that has to do with scheduling. And then you'll see, so there's options within these pragmas. Within the square braces, it says no wait. By default, all threads will wait at the, at the end of the loop once they finish their work before proceeding. When you have, when you say no wait, that says as long as a thread is finished its work, it can just continue down the program. Uh, and this is kind of a visual of what happens. But here I'm using three, three uh, threads, but each thread gets a third of the 100 iteration. And this, this is the essential, I think, part of what OpenFP provides is the work you know is the work sharing among threads. And the easiest example, the most visible example is a for loop. And in this case it's got 100 iterations and we're running over three threads. So each thread takes takes a part. Um, loop scheduling, I'm not going to go all over all of those, but this basically defines how the work gets distributed. Uh, some some schedules give like a contiguous set of iterations to a thread. Some it's, it's uh, round robin. Some it's the thread gets uh, some work um, and then comes back for more. And kind of just, you know, a continuous uh, assembly line. Uh, now the runtime, the runtime schedule, that's I believe is where if you set OMP underscore schedule, it will then take its schedule uh, from there dynamically based on what your environment is set. Um, more loop scheduling, ordered section. So if you're running loops and you're sharing threads, uh, each thread is doing its work independently within each iteration, but you can have a section within each iteration that's ordered and you can enforce some ordering among threads based on the iteration order. So you can have a part of the, iter part of the iteration could be happening independently. And then you can have a, a part of the iteration or the work within each iteration that has to happen in an ordered way. So you know, one, one, two, one, three, one, four. And these are just ways, so you're not writing explicit, you know, threaded code. You're basically saying, this is what I want to do. And then OpenMP gives you ways to distribute the work and to affect in some way um, the order in which it happens and provide some of these barriers to where they can happen in order. So um, I don't know if, uh, I can't claim and say you can implement like, well, probably you can't implement every algorithm numerical algorithm you can think of uh, in parallel with these like this. Um, but maybe you can, I don't know. But in any case, it's meant to be flexible and people, people have done some interesting stuff with it. Oh, loop collapsing. If you have a nested loop, you can say collapse two. So we're then basically each thread is getting IJ instead of I and then the thread itself is running, you know, iterating in that linear loop. You may want to collapse it. So it's, um, so it flattens it. Uh, task, I'm not going to, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, reductions, if you, each iteration has a, uh, it's like contributing to some, some value. And then at the end of the iteration, you want to add all of those up, you can use a reduction operator. Um, it just provide, allows you to have, not have to do the bookkeeping to track each thread's, uh, contribution to whatever your final sum is, which is going to be like a single value. Uh, picture um, sections. So sections are cool. You can define a section 
let's say we're running on three three threads you can have section three sections defined or some number and each thread will jump into a section whichever has a good uh, basically claim and then um, do the work and then move on so it's not going to be each section is not going to be repeated um, okay and then uh, but if you have like say more sections and threads it'll make sure all the sections are done once and then move on it's uh time did y'all want me to continue to go through this or are we good if you want to get up you can get up i think lunch is well i don't know if we have lunch is here but uh this is oh that's a picture of sections critical sections this just shows that uh, one thread can enter in at one time but that section is to be executed by each thread once. Uh, let's see, name critical section. This is what provides a pipeline effect. So each thread is gonna do each critical section, but only one at a time. This is kind of the picture. I can't guarantee this, the ordering is like this, but you get a pipeline effect. Atomic updates allows uh, within a parallel section this is like a critical section, but it allows the atomic updating, the safe updating of a shared variable. And that's it. Any questions? All right, please come to my talk tomorrow. Uh, if you found this interesting at all, you will find tomorrow uh, even more exciting. Uh, I'm excited. Thank you.